is not the, the first time that we discuss about innovation. Um, as a Covenant of Mayor Europe, we have been already organizing a first workshop. It was in the framework of the Innovate for City conference uh, that took place last October and it was organized by the colleagues of the Global Covenant of Mayor together with the UN Habitat. And uh, uh, we are going to hear a little bit more later on uh, by, by the colleagues that have been behind the organization directly. Uh, but um, it's worth to uh, mention that this workshop was seeing the contribution of the city of uh, um, Amsterdam, Leuven and Seoul. And together with representative of academia and the businesses, we discuss how innovation can really be something that all together uh, can be built collectively. Um, the discussion was really nice. We have very good inputs. And this workshop of today is a continuation of that discussion um, because we saw in that occasion that innovation is indeed something that is needed, but it's not that easy to realize. So we thought, why not to bring some good examples, some city that have been doing uh, a very good job in um, putting innovation and innovative elements in their um, in their daily work and ultimately in supporting their climate action. So um, why do we focus so much on innovation? Well, as you know, Europe wants uh, to be and is and committed to be the first uh, climate neutral continent by 2050. We'll have to reach net zero. And uh, in line with that, the Covenant of Mayor Europe have been updating their commitment and uh, um, is now having those four pillars that has been identified as key. So to really set targets, to act and to make sure that all stakeholders are involved in this collective endeavor. Um, so, um, of course, to take action and to move from commitment to implementation is something very much needed. As the IPCC report uh, released last year, the code read for humanity uh, stress, we have to do it urgently, but it's not just about doing, it's not just about doing quick, it's really about doing it differently. If we really want to achieve the results that we uh, set and our climate goals, uh, we have to think about a new way to do it, either with uh, innovative technologies or a new governance model. It can be a different way of financing uh, such initiatives or, uh, for example, uh, procedures and uh, the way that we engage our communities. Um, so all these elements are going to be discussed. Of course, uh, together with some good examples, a, a big help for European cities are a, the many opportunities that uh, um, is, are provided by uh, the, the European Commission. You see here on the screen just a little part of it, um, ranging from platforms to uh, share and uh, knowledge with peers to funding programs uh, from the very well-known Horizon 2020, uh, in which have some innovative uh, action and possibility to have uh, have funds for that to the new re newly released uh, European missions either on adaptation or mitigation. Um, so mm, with no further ado, it's my pleasure to briefly uh, in, in a very short time give the word to uh, the colleagues uh, from the Global uh, Covenant of Mayor, uh, Kathy Oak and Paddy Hartfield, that have been conducting a research that have been uh, really a trigger for um, this workshop. And we are going to, to hear from them the results for what regard uh, our region, uh, Europe. And then uh, it would be my pleasure to give uh, the floor to three very interesting experiences on the ground uh, to uh, Miss Jenny Vasche from the city of Hamburg. Uh, the agenda has not been updated, my apologies for that. Then we will have Lanfranco de Franco from the city of Reggio Emilia and finally Shan Odorange from the city of Itiquini in South Africa. Um, again, I will invite you all throughout 
the um, course of the presentation to put your question and your comment in the chat box. But we are going to have a, a very interactive part where we are really expecting you to take the lead. And this uh, open discussion is going to be presented uh, then by my colleague, uh, Eugenia Mansuti. Um, so uh, before giving the floor to Caris, to Kathy and Paris, there was a, a merge of the two. Um, we, um, we would like you to, to really see whether you have found the chat box and if you can uh, open that little space, you can tell us what is the first word that comes to your mind when you hear urban innovation. So we talk about, uh, I, I give some example of uh, different types of innovation. It's not just about technology, of course, but we would like to see which is the keyword that really pops up in your mind as the first thing? I see that something is coming. Well, collaboration and people, that's a very, very nice. Essential, of course, this is urban living labs, scale. Well, there is one reason why we ask you uh, to give this word and please uh, continue to to uh, to let us know what urban innovation triggers triggers in your mind, and this is because keywords have been analyzed by the colleagues uh, uh, that have been conducting this research. So, with this nice kind of prompt, I will invite I um, Kathy Oakes and Paris Hartfield to uh, take us through their results and what what are the the uh, outlooks for Europe. Over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Sylvia and, and Eugenia, for the um, for the opportunity for us to present um, tonight. Our time, um, Paris and I are joining from the from Melbourne, from the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, and um, I have my a kangaroo mug just in case you you <laughs> full of coffee. But um, you know, I really appreciate that this workshop is on um, both Eugenia and Sylvia, your members of the technical working group, um, the research and innovation technical worker and group of the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, for whom this work was undertaken, and we'll work through that in a moment. Um, and, but we really appreciate that this workshop is continuing the conversation that you started at the Innovate the Cities conference that you mentioned um, at the start, and that was in October. And, I see in the audience that uh, the, the new head of research and um, innovation for GCOM is in the workshop, Ben Hanse. So welcome and really great that he can join us. And, and also Natalie Isaac um, from Ironbark Sustainability, who is also a, um, a member of the research team um, that undertook this work that we'll talk to tonight with the title of as Sylvia has, um, has introduced around regional research and innovation for city climate action, um, and, and in particular, we'll, we'll be talking to some Europe, um, to the European findings. Um, and I will um, hand over to, to Dr. Paris Hadfield um, in a moment, who led the research with the technical working group, and, and um, she was with the University of Melbourne and now is with the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. Um, let's see if I can control the slides. Um, now, here we go. So here on your screen, um, we're just going to do a little bit of a background as to where the research came from and the, and, the, and the piece of work that Paris will speak to. But going back to Edmonton in 2018, it was the impetus not, for, not just for um, the research that we speak to tonight, but indeed the Innovate the Cities initiative of, of GCOM. And um, the Global Research Action Agenda for Cities and Climate Change Science um, came from this gathering of um, urban, um, urban folk, whether in research or science or um, in cities, academia, practitioners coming together to think about well, what are the gaps in understanding for cities, um, climate action, and, and how do we address or, or um, how do we progress the pathways to implementation of the knowledge gaps that were identified in 2018. And um, we don't need to go into too many details, but obviously this is a very important piece of work that came out of um, Edmonton. 
there's a web link on there and I'll put it in the chat while Paris is speaking um, for the original documents, but that essentially led to the, um, the, the establishment of um, Innovate for Cities as a, as a response to what, what do cities um, and city leaders in particular um, consider as the most important actions um, or, or even gaps within this global research action agenda for cities. Um, and the Innovate for Cities initiative is guided by a city, um, a, a city uh, research agenda, and it is um, currently being refreshed and reviewed as a result of the Innovate for Cities conference last year. And this beautiful wheel that you see on the screen here is also being updated with new insights into the gaps of knowledge, the innovation needed by cities um, and, um, and other urban actors, obviously. So that's the where that that started, and and the word global is really important there. It, it is a synthesis of an understanding of what's at the global scale, but clearly cities we know operate at a local context. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Sorry. Um, they um, operate at um, at the local level. They've got um, you know local challenges and local. I, sorry, Sylvia. I'm not. There's like a dueling. It's not moving forward. getting there in a moment but essentially <laughs> we had these global gaps but the research and innovation technical working group of GCOM um, granted it was online it was at the start of the the pandemic um, we all moved home and, and got onto our desktops and but we still wanted to understand well what does this mean on a regional basis so how are these gaps in knowledge uh, the the innovation needs of cities um, thought of um, or viewed or perceived at a regional scale. And so using the regional areas that, that GCOM uses, um, we set about on this piece of research um, through the University of Melbourne, I mean, in collaboration with Ironbark Sustainability and clearly with the Research and Innovation um, Technical Working Group at GCOM. And as you see in the slide, this research was, was undertaken to understand how cities um, identify research and innovation to meet their climate action needs um, on a regional basis. And the research asks, um, amongst other things, these two questions about how the cities integrate research and innovation in climate change action planning, and what climate problems and responses are commonly identified by cities in, the, in a global sample. And this global sample was, and we know that there are limitations um, and, and clearly it's not exhaustive or ex extensive and Paris will speak to a bit of that in a moment. But essentially it was a study of 98 city climate strategies randomly selected from across the 10 GCOM regions, published since 2016 in English. So again, we have issues um, of limitation there. We understand that um, by GCOM signatories with a population of 50,000 or more. And it has provided us with a knowledge base for improved advocacy um, because we can understand where cities are in the different stages within their climate strategies, thinking about investment, partnership, research, innovation, and indeed coordination across other levels of government. So these are all important, you know, it's important to understand from a city perspective what they're thinking about at these different stages. And we figured in the pandemic, we couldn't speak to them, everyone was really busy. Let's go to how they talk about it in their actual strategies. Um, and as I've already said um, before, you'll see a note there that um, a refreshed um, assessment, looking at current insights into these gaps in knowledge and innovation will be published in um, June this year. Um, and we will um, obviously let everyone know. But I'm gonna hand control over to, um, or, or maybe Sylvia, if you could hand control to Paris and she'll now talk through the results of the sample from um, the region that includes European cities. Thank you so much, Cathy. Um, to start, I'll take you all through the mitigation action results. Um, let's see if I can, yes. So focusing on how cities are, um, I guess, targeting their actions, we found that in the sample, 
actions were most commonly focused on residential emissions. So that was around 27% of all mitigation actions. Um, and I should say the sample included 944 mitigation actions. So we essentially took each action from the approximately 20 strategies um, from the European Union and Western Europe. And we categorized these um, by which target emission sector they focused on as one category. And so you'll see that we distinguish emission sources by sector. So we're looking at residential, commercial, government, and so on. So we're not, we're not yet breaking it down by um, energy and transport and such. But we used as a proxy um, kind of category, we looked at keywords in those actions. And so within the residential emissions um, target sector, often these spoke about energy, mobility, and buildings. Next, in terms of how these strategies integrated um, innovation, and we looked at this broadly in terms of research into solutions, understanding problems, um, undertaking feasibility studies, and pilot programs. So these were um, represented 17% of mitigation actions. And again, they commonly referred to energy buildings uh, and waste. And so this kind of indicated um, or provided a useful indicator of how um, cities were thinking about innovation in their planning um, and, and climate strategies and where that innovation was kind of taking place. And in that way, we could start to think about whether innovation um, investment and planning and testing is needed in perhaps other domains not commonly referred to in the sample. And finally, we looked at how cities uh, saw themselves in the strategies in terms of what city action, city, what action cities would, would take. So most mitigation actions involved interventions to drive emissions reductions in the wider community. And these are distinguished from, as I mentioned, the innovation type actions, as well as kind of broad statements of commitment. So most were those um, kind of broader interventions at a community scale and Often these involve financing developments or directly providing services. In terms of adaptation, the cities in the sample, um, and again, adaptation actions, there were 548 adaptation actions in the EU sample. Uh, these most commonly focused on extreme hot temperature as kind of the target problem to be addressed. So that was around 30% of all adaptation actions. These actions uh, commonly referred to water, public health, and green space. In terms of innovation and research, 18% of adaptation actions um, constituted these research and pilot type actions to understand problems and investigate solutions. And these often um, referred to water, green space, and public health. So again, these provide um, a sense of where, at least in our sample, um, how innovation is being undertaken and what kinds of problems might be being addressed. Um, and again, the sample is limited so we hope that these insights provide um, a kind of baseline or um, point of debate um, among cities to think about um, whether they feel represented, whether they think there are other priorities uh, to consider as well. And finally, again, most adaptation actions were those broader interventions to address climate impacts in the wider community. And in this case, uh, city authorities were most commonly developing strategies and implementation plans. So this is where we can start to think about how cities can effectively intervene uh, to drive um, mitigation and adaptation and what other um, ways or um, modes of governing are, are needed or could be tested. 
And finally, we drew, drew upon um, some supplementary data from the GCOM Tools and Decision Making Survey, and this was undertaken by GCOM in uh, early 2020. Um, and so a couple of questions um, were really relevant for this study. First was around challenges to climate action. And so most commonly uh, these were highlighted as securing funding within the city operating budget, uh, finance and investment from national and regional governments and integrating climate action into the day-to-day -day work of existing city departments. Conversely, the key enablers that were highlighted included innovative strategies for financing climate action, promotion and that application of social entrepreneurship and innovation, and green infrastructure opportunities to improve air quality. Now, I believe that's our um, summary of the research uh, focused on the European Union and Western Europe for now. Um, I'll hand back to Sylvia. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, both uh, Cathy and Paris, of course. This is a, a, this has been a long journey for you, starting from the uh, 2018 Edmonton and then carrying out this uh, great uh, study of climate action plans across the world, and then the survey on tools and decision making um, platforms and of course the release of the report and the innovate for city conference that is going to be uh feeding in a new update that is planned for the next year so thank you so much for presenting this all and uh, i will actually have uh one question that i might um ask because um, indeed this were the results for the European uh, Union and Western Europe region and uh, just maybe uh, to um, have a better understanding uh, uh, could you give uh, an idea of how are the regions locate uh, in, in the same uh, let's say uh, in the ranking in the same uh, actions uh, just because maybe the percentage uh, by itself it doesn't says too much and this is maybe uh, picking up also one question that came through by Sean uh, in the chat box asking if you observe differences between uh, cities in the global north and the global south and this might maybe provide insight and influence the city development status. I don't know this is if this is possible in a short time. Yes, Yes, I can take that question and, and thanks, Sean. That's a really interesting one. We didn't go so far as comparing global north and global south in terms of development, but we do have some high level um, insights to share in terms of the comparison. Um, for research and innovation, um, these actions range from, um, there was a quite a large range, so uh, from 4% of all actions to 24% in some regions. Uh, in terms of mitigation and likewise 9% um, all the way up to 35% of um, actions uh, for adaptation in different regions. Um, interestingly, there, were, there was a common emphasis on residential emissions um, in the global sample and likewise extreme hot temperature was also the most common target climate hazard in the global sample. And we were interested in these kind of similarities as well as the differences to think about how cities can um, work to exchange knowledge in that um, through peer-to-peer -peer exchange and learning and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of, I guess, the, the ways cities are um, undertaking climate action, um, financing development and directly providing services through mitigation was most common for um, not only Europe, but um, six other regions. Um, a notable difference was in East Asia, which focused um, or more commonly proposed education programs. And in North America, it was more about developing strategies and implementation plans as the most common. And in terms of adaptation, again, like the EU, four other, other regions also were most commonly developing um, strategies and implementation plans, um, whereas financing development was most common uh, for Africa, the Eastern, Eastern Europe and Middle East regions. And finally, reporting and communication was most common in South Asia. So that kind of gives a bit of a flavor of 
of the differences as well as where there were was alignment. Um, and yes, I hope that answered your question. Yes, indeed, and uh, we can uh, kind of confer probably uh, part of the observation at least, because indeed uh, we uh, we saw that adaptation uh, generally is uh, something that cities are uh, undertaking a little bit less comparing to in comparison with uh, mitigation. But this is also one of the big endeavors that uh, we as a Covenant of New York, uh, Europe office try to do to really push forward the integration of what we call to be our pillars of so mitigation and adaptation together with energy poverty. So thank you so much for that. And maybe one last question that uh, I have, and of course uh, I'm monitoring the chat, but please feel free to uh, to type any, any other uh, that might come to your mind, would be, um, you mentioned uh, that, that there was an analysis also of different kind of steps of um, innovation from planning to uh, feasibility study and assessment, piloting and then uh, financing actions. Um, did you observed in, in the research um, a particular a difficult step to overcome or where is the bottleneck? Uh, are cities not um, really even planning or they may plan but then have difficulty in testing or where we can see uh, the, the block, let's say? Um, oh, Siri, I feel like you almost answered your question in, in or answered it in your question because planning seems to be the stage where the it's maybe not a blockage, but it's where we believe looking at the the data that you know the greatest success. So you'd see greater success in achieving the targets that are set out in a city strategy if more planning in that planning stage a bit more consideration is on the maybe the targeted research needed for a specific cha a challenge specific to the city context because we know in inno you know innovation is often about scaling up or doing something that you've seen and be successful elsewhere that is one example of innovation and and often you know you might see cities saying we want to do that but with, maybe without considering in the planning stage either the budget or the capacity or the you know does it actually meet the challenge that the city you know context um dictates. So in that, that planning stage, we feel is maybe where innovation and research is least mentioned, rather than it's, there is more of a focus in the strategies on direct action and implementing a direct action rather than on pilots or, um, you know, research for a specific, um, a specific knowledge gap. So I think, yeah, the planning stage, but, you know, that might be, be being too obvious, but I think that's where, you know, these understanding the knowledge needs of cities and, and innovate, how innovation um, can, can help is, you know, where it becomes really interesting. You know, if, we, if it's all about accelerating action, um, how do we help cities to make the better decisions? And we, you know, to clearly think research and innovation and focusing on the knowledge needed by a particular cities is one way to unlock that, um, that scale that's needed. Well, thank you so much. Uh, indeed, uh, context is a very important element always to keep in mind. And um, we are going to hand uh, right very shortly uh, the floor to, to three examples. And it's good to keep in mind that um, any kind of replication needs to, uh, a good planning ahead in order to make it effective. And we really hope that by sharing those examples, uh, the, the colleagues on the line can think about including this from the very early stage of planning, as you were uh, suggesting. And I think that also the fact that you have been highlighting some challenges and enables that we can see still on the screen is very, it will be very helpful for the uh, upcoming discussion. So I invite everyone to uh, keep those points in mind. Uh, we will ask shortly your opinion about those. Um, but now maybe moving from uh, very general to some specific cases, I would like to uh, invite um, the colleagues unless there are any other question may i ask um eugenia if there is something yes. else yes Sylvia, there is actually a question from charlotte just popped up in the chat on how to take innovation into account in local climate policies and plans 
and if there are legal hurdles or solutions to review plans to take into account innovation and new solutions. I think, I don't know if, Katia and Paris, you have like a, like a very quick input, but Charlotte, that's also something that we will then address in the, uh, in the virtual whiteboard exercise. So I'm sure that we'll come to the question you're asking now, also later in the workshop. I can quickly comment on it very briefly, just to say that I think that's certainly an issue in terms of formal climate plans, um, whether a city feels able to take risk and be um, very directly um, promoting that as an innovative kind of testing approach. I think some strategies try to promote the city's achievements, um, which is, um, of course, fair enough. And um, I think that uncertainty around innovation and feeling uh, the need to be okay with potential failure and adapting and learning and trying new things is something that perhaps is a challenge, especially in um, planning. But I'll, maybe Cathy can say something else on that. Well, I think uh, we can go into more. I think those questions are really excellent ones. And I think let's bring them into the workshop coming up not to dodge the question, but I think that a lot of people online would be able to answer that question just as easily as me. So let's move on and, and let's discuss in the workshop. So maybe uh, taking the invitation from Paris uh, and, and Cathy to, uh, to expand this uh, later on, I will now uh, be happy uh, and have the pleasure to give the floor to our um, first uh, city example. Uh, so uh, it will be from the German city of Hamburg. We have the pleasure to have you with us, uh, Jennifer Wascher, who is the head of the Department Federal European and International Affairs. So Jennifer, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Thank you, Eugenia. And good morning, everybody. And actually, I have to say, I would rather go into further details of a discussion right now, since it's already been so interesting with all the comments and, and all the findings that were presented. But uh, we'll leave that to later. So that's just fine. So let's see. Um, I have just a quick technical thing, Sylvia. Um, I see, cannot seem to be working, uh, moving the, oh, yes, I can. Perfect. All right. Very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so as Sylvia mentioned, um, I will focus um, on well, I will focus on the business part of local innovation of sustainable energy and climate action. Um, this is um, because we are a pretty big city with them using lots of um, different um, businesses in our climate action. One of the reasons we were awarded the title European Green Capital back in 2011 was actually that we already have a strong focus on CO2 reduction and of a cooperation with um, businesses. And in the past years, we have been broadening that perspective on much needed in innovation. And I have to admit, if this were a German um, audience, I would probably refrain from calling my, uh, my presentation experimentation because that would create fear of, of um, novelty and fear of the unknown. And that does not resonate with German reliability. So um, here I know that's fine. And that's actually what we're doing, innovation and experimentation. But still, as I say, um, there are some people who think we should probably stick to the old and conservative. So as I said, Hamburg has been um, cutting CO2 emissions um, for the, well, actually starting late last century. Um, and uh, we really have be, um, gotten really serious about that with our climate plan in 2007. So we are dedicated to become climate neutral by 2015. And our lastly updated climate plan shows the way to do that. Well, maybe to make it a little more conceivable, to reach the intermediate goal in 2030, we have to reduce our CO2 emissions by 7 million tons per year. That's about one third of the German aviation per year. So that is quite, quite a goal. Considering that we have already been able to do that, um, to do that in to, between 2000 and 2000, in 2017, we've already been able to cut that by 4 million. 
yes, that's been quite a few years, but now, as you all know, the further you get into cutting, at the beginning, it's always easy. And later on, it's really difficult because you get kind of at the end of the pipe. So it is quite challenging. And now we also have to admit Germany as a, as a, um, as a country has decided to become climate neutral by 2045. So we will need to adapt to that because, of course, we cannot say that we still stick to our 2050 goal. As the second largest city in Germany, um, the, um, Hamburg is characterized by, well, the port, as you can see here in the picture, and it's a, it's a national port providing uh, not only Germany, but also Eastern Europe um, with a logistic hub. We have um, heavy industry, energy intensive raw material industries and companies, uh, trade, commerce and service sectors. So looking at it from a climate point of view, those are all sectors that really contribute to CO2 emissions. So um, I will focus, as I said, on the economic um, transformation path, as we call it. Of course, we're also working in other sectors, and those sectors are even more challenging. I'm talking about mobility. I'm talking about buildings, a huge factor in Germany. Very difficult since we have we have a no, we don't have a homeowners market, but we have a renters market market. So there's the social aspect to that, and I noticed that I think Lan Franco was talking about equality and urban innovation. And of course, now this discussion has been really going on, especially now looking at the Ukraine and um, on an energy um, supply and so on. So this is this is very challenging as well. But I will I will stick to businesses. Um, as I was asked to do so. So um, we need to transform our city to a climate friendly and sustainable energy supply. That is the key factor right now if we talk about businesses. Um, and there's actually a few main topics that we need to focus on and that's actually networks and intelligent energy production advice and further training, further development of funding programs, and one of the big issues is sector coupling. I will come to that. We have several instruments using that, that is advisory, that is support for sharing experiences between the companies and technology, integration of university, which is a big factor in innovation. We're doing pretty, not really well in Germany doing that as two different streams, so to say businesses and, and um, Universities, other countries are really, especially the United States, as far as I know, are really better doing integrating these two different aspects of innovation into, into their um, policy. So I will lay out a few measures um, that we're taking in our transformation path, economy-wise speaking. And one is actually the, um, the um, and which is called the North Van Germany Energy Change. Let's see if I can get to the next slide here right now. Could probably, could anybody else do the, thank you so much, thanks. It doesn't seem to be working that well for me right now. So um, what you can see here on, on this slide um, and maybe for the, for the audience, um, the blue part in this map here, um, that is the region that we're working on in the Northern German Innovation Alliance. Down here in the, um, I don't know, you probably cannot see that, uh, the further south part of the blue part in the map, that's actually the Hamburg region. Um, so you can imagine that a city like Hamburg, a harbor city, is actually very energy hungry. And the industry allow, alone accounts for almost 30% of the CO2 emissions. And considering that the last, last German nuclear plant is getting or is be taken off the grid at the end of this year, and we are to phase out coal by 2038, there's not that many sources of energy. Of course, talking um, from the climate point of view, renewables is the answer, but they are mostly volatile and depending on the sun and the wind. And of course, you can imagine we don't really have that much sun. Of course, the technology has advanced, but still it is volatile. So this is where um, the sector coupling comes into play. So in order to increase the use of electricity from renewable sources, the energy demand needs to be adapted to the volatile supply from especially wind turbines. 
Given our limited space as a city, we do not have that many wind turbines, but our immediate neighbor, and that is the blue part further up from the further south part here in the map, our neighbor, the state of Schleswig-Holstein, really does have an abundance of wind turbines. Um, so we need to focus on sector coupling, which means flexible adaptation of energy consumption and energy generation by the companies. I will not go into the details on that because that's quite that's quite uh, that's quite technical. Um, but what we're actually trying to do is using the excess power produced by the wind turbines in Schleswig-Holstein in the northern part of that blue map, and we try to find storage facilities. And of course, and there's uh, lots of technology. It's called power to X, so power to different kind of technologies using that for energy storage systems, heat storage systems, and of course nowadays hydrogen, green hydrogen, which is a big thing in Germany and I think everywhere it seems to be also the cure for everything, but that's, that's a different discussion. So the basic requirement is actually to do the sector coupling and availability of sufficient wind energy. And that requires work on the network, that requires regular uh, regulatory frameworks. I saw that in the chat that that's also, that's also an issue for, for climate action plans as well. So, um, one of our steps is this project that we're doing with um, Schleswig-Holstein, and maybe if somebody could give me the next slide, that'd be nice. Um, this is a project where we have about 65 partners from all over. This is public, public companies, this is um, universities, this is private companies. Um, the whole region is comprised of about 45 I'm sorry, 44.5 million people. And we um, try to be, to have this region climate neutral by 2035 um, in that sector, so to say. And maybe you can ask yourself, why hasn't it worked so far? It's probably because we have been using renewable energies ineffectively. We have um, congestions in the grid because of the excess energy, and we actually are throwing away excessive energy and that cannot be. So this is why we're trying to do in this, uh, why we're trying to work in this in this project. And what we're doing is that we have about, that we had about a hundred single projects along the entire value in the chain of the energy sector. And uh, that those were projects um, where, for example, a company um, uses energy at nighttime for their, um, for the, for the, um, um, storage of, um, of uh, goods that have to be kept cold, for example. That's one of these little things that we all know from the household discussions with the using your dishwasher and your, but actually it works also on, um, on, uh, on a larger scale. And this is what Kathy was talking about, the scaling up, which is really important um, in, in, these, in, these ex, uh, in these aspects. So what we can say now from this first project I'm talking about is that we had about 20 demonstrators um, providing 200 and megawatt of flexibility. So flexibility is something in technical terms, meaning that you can actually use energy that you have to, yet you have to alleviate the energy grid from the congestions by storing energy in different areas and then using it again. So that's that worked on that hard on the demonstrators. And now we have to go into testing. We've been doing the research, we've been doing the, the we've had the uh, demonstrators, but now it's about scaling up. Next step would be the testing. And next slide, please, if possible. This is what we're now doing um, with the um, Northern German Real World Laboratory. The on-grid production of, of green hydrogen is actually at the center of this whole project. So we will have, for example, a large electrolyzer of 25 megawatt in the harbor area, producing hydrogen by consuming excess electricity from renewables. And then this actually works and serves for different off-takers in industry, mobility, and energy. So we're trying what we actually do, if you, if you, if you boil it down to one point, we're trying to well, actually store energy and provide it to different sectors after that, which is technically speaking, one of the biggest things. And of course, hydrogen also means if you produce hydrogen by renewables, you have 
lots of loss in energy because it's actually something very energy intensive to produce green hydro hydrogen or at least hydrogen, but still better than to throw it away, the excess energy that we have. So now, um, next slide, please. Um, so now we are um, exploring into actually having more stakeholders, more sector couplings as not only production in industry, but also in mobility and other, other sectors. So next slide, please. Um, this is really large scale, big, a big project, but also we have small projects, so to say. So we are working on funding. We have a funding, um, we have a funding pro, a program, for example, that is designed to especially help the SMEs to um, work on, um, to do, to implement innovation um, with um, production of goods, resource energy, and so on. Next slide, please. So in the beginning, I was talking about um, advisory services, exchanging best practices between, between companies. And this is actually what the Eco Partnership is doing. So it is a network of companies dedicated to go, well, the extra mile in the environmental production to actually go beyond legal uh, requirements to reduce even further CO2 em emissions, to reduce, to reduce the use of materials, to be resource efficient and so on. So this company are exchanging the best practices among each other. The city advises and consults with what, with what can be done, easy access advisory, low threshold and so on. But of course the, city, the companies itself have to do the investment. But the first step is actually provided by the, by, by the city. It involves comp big companies, but also small companies like a hairdresser, for example, or a bakery. So this is also dedicated to SMEs, but it's actually, it's, it's, it's been a community that has been built up. We have now about 1,500 companies being eco partners, and it is very much welcome for those companies to use their status as an eco partner for marketing purposes. So you can see actually a label, you see here the label on the green label on the bottom of the slide, you, they can actually put it up in, on, this, on the storefront, for, so to say, or in their materials to say, well, we're doing this, which is good because it's a two-way, it's a two-way street, so to say. Um, so next slide, please. And we can actually close with that slide because those were just a few examples of, of what we're doing. And I am sure it is not rocket science, but I am fully aware that Hamburg is pretty well off financially speaking. So we were talking, and in the chat we were talking about the South and the North and Global South, Global North, and of course this is different. So although I really foster um, exchange between cities and I really believe that this is important, you cannot always compare the cities with each other. Size-wise, we're 1.8 million people. We have, we're, we're also a city state. So we have legislative powers that all the states in, Ham in Germany do have. Um, and we are pretty rich, so this helps a lot. But of course, like something like the Eco Partnership, for example, that is something that I remember that Vitoria Gasteiz, which is a small city in, well, small compared to, to Hamburg, in, in, in the Basque country in Spain, they are also having, they also have this program of the Eco Partnership. And it doesn't cost that much if you have the right incentives for the companies to implement. So I think we can, we can exchange um, these, these best practices as well. And if you have any questions or if you would like to share your experience, please feel free to contact us. Then our names would be on the, net, on the last slide, please. Yes, so um, thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Indeed, a very interesting one. Uh, you mentioned a lot of things. I have a paper full of notes, uh, but I think it's very interesting uh, and the way that you close saying that uh, indeed, as also Kathy was mentioning at the very beginning, uh, it's not possible to just copy paste action, but indeed uh, there are room for taking inspiration and some of those with the due, um, with the due adaptation can be 
uh, replicated elsewhere. And since one of the uh, points that you mentioned is, uh, for example, uh, the um, room for improvement in the uh, linkages that you have with the university, well, we will have afterwards a, a presentation uh, that might give you some inspiration on this regard. So we hope for this week's workshop to really kind of sparkle some of this exchange. Um, you have been extensively talking about the relationship with businesses. Uh, we asked to focus on that on purpose because uh, we have uh, the city of Regimilia that will present how they've been engaging citizens, so another very important stakeholder, to create innovation at the local level. So it's my great pleasure to give the floor to Elan Franco de Franco, who is Deputy Mayor for Housing Policies, Participation, Social Center and Volunteer, among the others, <laughs> um, to, to take the floor and um, tell us a little bit more about what Emilia is doing. Elan Franco, the floor is yeah. yours. Thank you for inviting us to show our project. It's uh, difficult to speak after the great experience of Hamburg. And uh, we are also in uh, um, some uh, common project with the city of, of Hamburg. So uh, I, will, um, I will talk about uh, uh, more like a, a process, the, a protocol which uh, we apply to um, reach uh, the involvement, the empowerment of the uh, quintuple helix of uh, the society in uh, uh, our uh, project of uh, urban innovation, urban uh, development. Uh, so let's see if the slide works. Yeah. Um, so um, our project, our protocol, uh, it's called uh, Quartiere Bene Comune, which means uh, neighbor as a common, and uh, is uh, a collaborative project. Uh, and the, the aim is to have a city. Uh, we are a medium-sized city, uh, 172,000 uh, inhabitants in the northern Italy near Bologna. And uh, the, the aim is to have a city where the relationship between uh, the central administration and the community uh, can be based on uh, sharing the goals and uh, uh, sharing also the programs and the projects uh, required to achieve them, uh, but starting always from uh, uh, a neighborhood level. Um, for us, a neighborhood is not an administrative uh, division of the territory, is uh, a place of identity and belonging. So. Uh, the, the, this collaboration between uh, the municipality and the community is based on uh, uh, agreement pacts where everyone involved is uh, co-responsible for resulting innovation and improvement side together. So uh, the, the, our aim, our goal is to build a more stable city that works as a, a common good. Um, the, this approach, uh, the neighbor as common approach, uh, is based, uh, as I was saying before, on the cooperation um, of the public, uh, private, knowledge, social and civic actors, the, as I was saying, the so-called quintuple helix, and it's uh, established by, and regulated through um, this uh, public community and uh, public-private community partnership uh, agreements. Um, which we, we, they are called the citizenship uh, uh, pacts, uh, which enable uh, uh, sustainable innovation and also we will see some scientific experimentation in the city. Uh, so th this kind of approach uh, um, entails a strong focus on the uh, valorization of the local know-how, as I was saying, starting from the neighborhood level, and uh, um, also the recognition of the community stewardship uh, rights, so the right of use, but also the right of uh, co-management and the final right of the co-ownership. And this right applied over uh, urban critical assets and uh, infrastructure, which uh, are called the called the urban commons. So um, these two elements are pillars, are key ingredients to trigger inclusive uh, urban sustainable development, especially when we talk uh, um, of, about uh, uh, the private uh, neighborhood. Um, 
So the goals uh, are uh, maintain the relationship with uh, the neighborhood also after the end of the experience with the district the districts in uh, the Italian circoscrizioni were abolished uh, 12 years ago by the uh, national government. So we uh, had the goal to maintain the relationship with the neighborhood starting from a different point of view. The opportunity to, uh, so this gave us the opportunity to define the central periphery model. Our, another goal was to um, generate or regenerate the social uh, uh, capital uh, and uh, um, we, we, the aim was to reach this goal, implementing a new paradigm of uh, uh, participation and a new model, uh, an horizontal model of administration. And the final goal was to generate innovation and competitiveness uh, um, with uh, uh, innovation within uh, the uh, production process and uh, uh, within policy solutions. So um, now I, I will give you I will give you some examples. But uh, uh, I think our contribution to this uh, uh, discussion is maybe more uh, on the kind of process we put on the floor. Um, uh, and uh, to um, to give an uh, to give an example of uh, a, a process of uh, uh, complete involvement of all the um, all the part of uh, the, the the society. So in the now we are in the second round of this project, but uh, uh, the the first round we finished in 2019 at uh, uh, 100 1,500 participants. So uh, nearly one association uh, uh, on three, so the, the, the 36 percent of the, the uh, association of our municipality were involved, and uh, um, about uh, one percent of the uh, 100 percent of the citizens, and uh, you, uh, uh, 784. Uh, um, association or citizen or economic activities signed these citizenship pacts. Uh, in total, there were 27 uh, agreements signed, uh, which, uh, uh, and they contained 163 uh, projects. And you can see the, the number and the hours of uh, a volunteer uh, involved uh, and also not volunteer, but uh, economic activities or other kind of association. And uh, uh, I think it's important to say that uh, uh, nearly at the end of the of the uh, project, nearly the eight, uh, eighty percent of the uh, project where uh, we managed to uh, to finish and to uh, reach uh, the eighty percent of the of the project uh, contained in the in the agreement. So um, I personally, um, the issues are. Uh, course sustainability so um, we I, I make uh, just three example the the project involving the pedestrian and cycle mobility project we uh, are trying we are in the, in the middle of uh, uh, the uh, Padana plan in the northern Italy so it's not uh, easy to see us and a city of trades but we are trying to um, make our citizens Think about our city as a city of trade, and we are reaching it. We are we have uh, um, we have uh, uh, eighty uh, kilometers of trades uh, um, uh, managed with the the citizens and the association involved in pedestrian mobility. The enhancement of uh, uh, public goods that were uh, not used at all or uh, with a little use, so also. Uh, an, an ancient villa which was uh, uh, not used in the property of the university and uh, we are co-managing with uh, the citizens with activities and they are managing uh, uh, their self we, and we are thinking about uh, uh, a project of co-ownership so to uh, let uh, the neighborhood uh, be the owner of these uh, common goods for us it's a common good and uh, the last is the, the last example is about uh, other um, project of urban regeneration which uh, for example the Bottega di Quartier project uh, in which we uh, put some uh, um, young uh, um, 
uh, young uh, acti local economical activities of the neighborhood in uh, uh, public uh, um, public uh, place that were uh, uh, not used uh, in, the, in the last uh, year. So we are trying to uh, reuse them and uh, to reuse with uh, the economical activity of uh, young, uh, young people, young professionals. Uh, another uh, project was the uh, community Wi-Fi uh, and uh, um, the project for what uh, for, uh, was for the provision of uh, interconnectivity uh, with uh, a public broadband organized by the neighborhood community through the social center of uh, this neighborhood. And we are now three neighborhoods in the city in which uh, the social center has become the district provider uh, of the uh, broadband. Uh, and uh, uh, the goal was to overcome the digital divide uh, uh, through a um, uh, good, efficient uh, organization on a neighborhood scale, and we managed to reach, to reach uh, this goal in three uh, neighborhood. And uh, um, helping us to reach uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, urban innovation project and to uh, make them uh, sustainable uh, in an uh, um, economical uh, scale and to uh, reply them in all the neighborhood of the city or other cities that uh, could uh, take uh, as examples, uh, we um, decided to uh, have uh, a city science office. Uh, and for example, in this project, we are with the municipality of uh, Hamburg, Hamburg also. And uh, um, so the, the, uh, the city science office uh, deals with uh, applied research in, uh, as I was saying, the field of urban innovation. And uh, we created it in a collaboration with the university and our local open laboratory in the uh, JRC program. And uh, the goal is uh, to help uh, the local administration to, um, to manage uh, the uh, goals of uh, uh, sustainability, uh, digital innovation and social innovation, uh, always with the uh, citizen engagement, the support uh, uh, to acquisition and upgrade of skills uh, to cope with the digital and climate transition and experimenting with uh, social innovation as a pre-incubation place for our project. Uh, so we are trying to, to start with the CSO pro, uh, project. And I think in this second round of uh, uh, citizenship uh, uh, pacts, uh, we are reaching uh, an higher scale. So I could say in the last five years, we uh, tried the protocol, we, uh, the, the prototype of the process. Now we are uh, taking it into another level to have a bigger project and uh, project uh, uh, to reach the aim of co-ownership of the uh, real co-ownership and commandment of the urban commons. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lanfranco. It was extremely interesting uh, to see how you really are acting in a holistic manner. You mentioned at the very beginning that this in innovation is uh, about uh, processes, and indeed this is e of equal importance uh, in order to, to make innovation happening, how, how um, exactly in the way that you very nicely presented. Um, it's about policy, it's about but it's interesting to see this uh, upscaling from core design, which we are slowly getting to used to as a term, to co-management and co-ownership. So this is really going to next level, and uh, we will be. Uh, I will be very interested to learn more about this and how you really manage to to integrate within your city plan those actions uh, afterwards in the discussion. So uh, again, if anyone has any question, please put it in the in the chat box. We will pick them up later on. Uh, but I will move uh, now to the uh, third 
uh, and last example, uh, having a special guest from outside of Europe, uh, bringing some uh, inspiration from uh, South Africa. We have Shen Odenogi, uh, head of the climate change adaptation department in the city of Itwihi. Uh, so uh, Shen, uh, over to you to present how you've been able to really bond uh, a strong partnership with uh, uh, the local universities. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Sylvia. Uh, can I just uh, confirm that everyone can hear me and hopefully see me? Lovely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, greetings, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, before we go any further, the city of Etikwini is also known as Durban, <laughs> so that might be a little bit more familiar to our European neighbours. Um, so if we could advance the slide, please. Um, I think let's start from, uh, there's my uh, sort of the, the lead slide. If we can go to the first main slide, please. Let's start from the point of what we share uh, between the South and the North. We uh, share a lot of very similar climate change challenges like heat and flooding and sea level rise. And we've heard about that already. Uh, but the point of departure here is how it impacts us because of our very different contexts. So we are a, very, a rapidly developing city of the global south uh, with a big population of almost 9 million people with uh, real development uh, backlogs and challenges uh, and then other issues like HIV and governance challenges and uh, climate change is just one of these layers of challenges uh, that we have to deal with but we also use it as a, an opportunity to deal with existing challenges and we'll get into that in a little while. Um, so because we have these novel sort of problems that we're trying to deal with, we have to use things like transdisciplinary research and the co-generation of knowledge and co-governance uh, that, uh, that we heard uh, really nicely talked about up to now to help us uh, answer these questions. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and so in the city of Durban, we've had now about 10 years of formal transdisciplinary research that has helped us um, start developing the answers to these questions as to help us manage the city. Don't worry too much about the horrible acronyms on here. Just notice that each one of those represents a research program in our ongoing research action partnership. And I want to talk to you just about one of those acronyms. You'll see it on the arrow there called EPIC, and it stands for Educational Partnerships of Innovation uh, for Innovation and Communities. And that's the innovation we're talking about here. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and this is not our innovation. This is something that came out of the States. They've been doing it for about 10 years, this EPIC model. And basically the, the premise is that you have a lot of uh, university courses being taught uh, on a range of different disciplines. And what if you can connect these courses to a, a community of particular interest? And the example we're gonna look at today is one of our informal settlements in the city of Durban. Uh, and if you can use students to answer research questions to uh, uh, focused on that community. Uh, so that the city benefits, but it really it's a win-win situation. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and this is what a typical EPIC program, a partnership between a city, a university, and a focused community looks like in the States. Uh, and you can see there's a whole bunch of hours dedicated to research to answering uh, the problems in that community. Uh, in our example, uh, which is on the next slide, please, we've had to start slowly and smallly as uh, smaller as a pilot, uh, and we're gradually building up our EPIC program in the city of Durban. Um, and we started this in a this uh, informal settlement where there was already a community-based uh, shared governance approach to managing the problems in the catchment in which this uh, informal uh, informal settlement is. Uh, it was a, a place where there was a very fractious relationship between the city and the settlement leaders. You know, there was a lot of electricity theft happening. Uh, you know, like there weren't, you know, it's not land that's owned by them. It's typical problems of an informal settlement. This might be of interest to Europe as uh, informal settlements are growing in Europe. So maybe this is something we can teach you about <laughs> how to deal with informal settlements. And through a process of sharing governance, we've really opened up our relationship with the uh, leaders and the settlement residents. 
But this is particularly about EPIC now. How did the EPIC uh, partners help uh, address challenges? Will our students from a development planning module answer a whole range of uh, problems in the, in the settlement? Uh, and some of the achievements were developing a disaster response plan that was relevant for informal settlements. And we were able to put within our disaster management unit in the city to help us understand how better to address uh, problems, uh, 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 disaster response in informal settlements. Also producing a booklet around adaptation options being used in informal settlements. And here the, the residents actually became the researchers and, uh, you know, for example, guiding us on vulnerability in the settlement. So it's really a good example of how through a, a, a shared approach, we can answer challenges. Uh, next slide, please. We uh, have been working with the uh, EPIC Secretariat in the United States to roll out this model in Africa. And we have an African network that um, is getting going, uh, you know, notwithstanding the challenges of COVID, which has really been hamstringing uh, efforts of our sort of nascent uh, partnerships on the African continent to get going. But there's some really good solution, uh, some examples there now that you can see, you know, using COVID as an opportunity to, to get kickstart uh, EPIC programs um, in Mombasa, for example. Um, Lusaka has saved a lot of money in consultant fees because uh, these, this model uses innovation of students and it, it really does save uh, costs because uh, you really just need a, someone from the city side and the university side pairing together to set up the individual uh, modules. Uh, and it's obviously at that module level that these questions are answered. Uh, so let's look, uh, spend our remaining time on what are the key enablers and what are the challenges uh, we are finding. Well, one of the, the key enablers I just mentioned is cost efficiency. You know, it, it works well. It saves both the city money on consultants, but it also saves module coordinators because they don't have to do the running around, you know, and helping the students get to the city government to do their surveys or into communities to do their surveys. Um, and so it represents a win-win-win situation. Um, it really uses the innovation of youth and students. One of the big problems we have in South Africa is they finish their degree schemes and they've got no experience to apply for jobs. This helps them build the experience uh, on their CVs. Uh, the communities benefit because they get a whole range of research being done on their problems across a range of dis different disciplines. And that body of knowledge really sort of helps to unlock solutions that you might not normally uh, get with a, a, a sort of a consultant doing the work. The challenges, uh, I think we'll see this is quite common. Uh, we've seen it in the presentations. New approaches are not always that easy to convince people to, to do. But having started with a, a pilot approach and building it up now, that's been our sort of key to success. And we really are finding academics uh, coming on board like a, a rolling snowball. Um, okay, uh, COVID-19 has been a massive challenge, uh, you know, loss of funding. So our DRAP that I mentioned earlier, we're really battling with uh, funding uh, to get a fourth phase that we really wanted focused on epic um, and, and our climate change problems. To get around that, we're now looking for externally funded research programs. I think that's, uh, you know, kind of explanatory. I'll leave it there, Sylvia, because that's my eight minutes. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, very much. Uh, sticking to the time, that's fantastic. And again, a lot of information. Um, it was, uh, yeah, really nice to see, uh, or maybe not that nice to see that actually uh, the fear of novelty that Jenny was mentioning at the very beginning seems to be uh, equally present in all regions. But uh, let's see, I mean, you mentioned the fact that by starting with the pilots and then uh, showing by uh, implementing one single action, how this could 
actually work on the ground was uh, helpful to convince. And uh, uh, definitely I will have some question about how this process worked in, in details and how you managed to have the buy-in of your colleagues and get them on board and your idea. And uh, um, it's uh, yeah interesting um, also that you mentioned the fact that inhabitants are really becoming, so it's not just about involving the community, the, the university, but also the community on the ground there participating and sharing the knowledge that they have. Let's say that maybe this um, citizen science uh, uh, concept is kind of starting now to move the first steps in, in Europe and become more and more uh, present. Uh, but this seems to be something that you have been doing for quite a while now. So uh, it's something that we can learn from uh, together with the informal settlement, definitely. And one important element, of course, is youth, uh, which is particularly important for, for us in Europe this year as it has been announced to be the year of youth so a lot of attention is given to how they can really contribute uh, to to make climate action more impactful at the local level so thank you so much um i may be asked to eugenia whether there are some questions in the chat box i will stop sharing my screen so that i can see you all Yes, thanks, Silvia. So we have a question from Marian uh, from Nagoya University, uh, and that's a question about uh, it's a question to, to Lanfranco de Franco, so to the example of Radio Emilia, on how Radio Emilia has approached the neighbors to recruit volunteers to be engaged in the project, uh, and also what was the scope of participation and co responsibility. So basically, I think it's also a question about the division of roles between the volunteers, the city administration, and the other parties involved. So we, we started approaching people uh, starting from the previous district networks. So we, we, we started from uh, networks of uh, association and volunteers in 2015 um, from the previous experience of the, of the district. But uh, um, in this kind of project, we um, reached uh, uh, many more people that uh, were not involved in the districts, uh, many associations that were not involved in the previous institutional uh, uh, framework, and also we have a, a project of uh, uh, single volunteers uh, coordinated by the municipality, which is called Air Plus. So, if a single volunteer want to join, we have also this. Uh, a tool to uh, make them all the insurances and all the uh, <laughs> legal staffs that uh, a volunteer need to be safe and to act in the various type of uh, uh, projects. So we, we, we start from uh, the single volunteer that can be reached by our communication, our institutional communication or uh, 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 neighborhood level communication. So also grassroots movement and uh, uh, people uh, uh, involved in previous projects and also uh, with uh, more previously organized uh, association with uh, hundreds of uh, volunteers and so on. And uh, the scope of uh, participation co-responsibility, I think this uh, scope uh, is the um, to, to build uh, to build um, a more sustainable society in an environmental way, but also social way, economical way. And uh, it, for us, the process is important because uh, with this kind of uh, uh, protocol, I think we are empowering uh, the citizens, uh, not uh, um, only because they can uh, uh, become a co-owner of a uh, urban common, but also the empowerment uh, about the sh sharing the knowledge about the uh, the, the knowledge uh, of the public administration in uh, I'm not I'm talking about infrastructure, public works, and so on, and also um, the, the the knowledge that uh, a group of citizens need to uh, co-manage. Uh, uh, complex uh, project, uh, also talking about the management of, uh, uh, as I was saying before, a park or a villa, or uh, to to build uh, uh, some uh, kilometers of trays uh, in the in the city. So 
I, I think it's about sharing uh, experience, knowledge, and to empower uh, the, the, the citizens and the quintuple helix and to, uh, to, to try to, to build some, somehow a more equal society where more people have, uh, are involved in the, in, the, in the power or in the, in, the, in the process of the public administration. Thank you very much, Lanfranco. Yes, please. I just wanted, to thank, just wanted to thank him. Thank you so much for your response and for the amazing presentation. Everyone, thank you so much. Thank you, Marin. Yes, indeed. I mean, I think it's uh, it was full of content. Uh, and actually, if I may, I also have a question I would like to ask uh, to Gianni because I was particularly uh, interested during your presentation about the uh, so the eco partnership and the actually the label you mentioned and the fact that the businesses involved are using it for marketing purposes. I think that's extremely interesting, especially now that more and more cities actually are also looking to become climate neutral. They're also looking to, uh, to tackle emissions from uh, scope three sectors, and actually they will have to work more and more on consumption. Uh, so involving citizens also uh, with more awareness of the choices they make, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be, I mean, it's going to become increasingly interesting for more cities that are also less advanced probably in terms of ambition and targets. Uh, so it's a, it's a very important example. I think we should uh, spread the word out uh, more. Uh, and then um, uh, a specific question on partnerships uh, I had was actually, uh, what was the most difficult part in getting the businesses on board in the, in the eco-partnership? And you also said it has a long history, actually. It was renewed uh, three times. Uh, so I wonder how many challenges, I mean, not how many, but how, which type of challenges you had uh, to confront uh, and if you had to reassess the, the approach uh, when you were uh, increasing the pool of businesses involved or renewing these partnerships. So how was the process? I, I imagine it was not a linear process because it's, uh, it's a very big, uh, um, big project. Uh, run that by me again. Do, do you want to know about the partnership, the eco partnership, and these these obstacles, or um, yes, about the eco partnership? Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. All right. So um, we started in at the beginning of the century, which is um, crazy to say, but well, um, as as a word. Um, I think we we started more or less with a low threshold. So we were saying, well, um, if we we reached out to um, uh, I forgot the word for that to um, to stakeholders representations so the chamber of commerce the chamber of craft um, and they are on board so actually the eco partnership the, the steering board so to say is formed out of the city the eco partner uh, the, the chamber of commerce and the chamber of craft and we developed a program with them. So we said, well, uh, what can we do? Um, in or for, for us, it was in order to for foster um, the company's engagement into, as I say, um, introduce measures. And it, at first it started like, well, why don't you exchange your, electri uh, your electricity system in your administrative building of this company to um, in energy efficient systems for us to say. So, um, we started out um, using Chamber of Commerce and Chamber of Craft, who have quite a high credibility as, as a partner here in, in the city. And um, they reached out to their members and introduced the program. We said, well, we would, if you would like to become a partner, you have to um, fulfill at least three criteria. So we offered criteria on who is eligible um, um, for becoming an eco partner, and of course we have um, the steering. The steering board has meetings, and we have a full um, plenary meeting with all the eco partners. So to see what do they need, um, what do we need, and so on. Um, the obstacles that we had at first, of course, was can imagine in two thousand and three the whole thing of environmental protection, let alone climate protection. Climate protection became en vogue again in 2007 with the Stern report. So um, that's when actually it, it, it really became something on a general basis. So it was at first it was more about, um, about resource efficiency, about um, clean air, about um, um, noise and so on. So um, the first companies 
were maybe your typical companies uh, that you would be working with um, that have already been engaging into um, in, in, in environmental protection. And then it kind of was like a snowball effect. So after that, um, uh, companies said that these, or the company said that eco partners may, might have better access to the city. And I'm not talking about lobbying, but, you know, but maybe that too, I would not I never say that um, as in, um, well, we need a better regulation for that or so that I don't mean that, but um, they notice that they get, get free advisory um, and they can actually do also internal communications towards their employees who more and more nowadays will more and more focus on, on that. So the obstacles actually, they were, we didn't really think at first we need to have so many companies. We started slow. And I think it kind of established itself as a network. So that probably helped. But of course, there were, there were companies that said, oh, those echo crazy people, what's going on there? We don't need that and so on. So we had that too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, and do they come on board at the end, those companies that were more skeptical at the beginning? I'm sorry? Uh, did these companies that were more skeptical at the beginning, when the snowball effect started to, to kick in, did they eventually come on board? Some of uh, them and did. And change their policies? Yeah, yeah, some of them did, some of them didn't. Some, there's, you know, I don't know if other cities experienced the same thing, but of course there's some, some companies do really want to keep the distance. They don't want to, they know that, well, you know, that's the city administration, lame employees, um, strange politics and so on. So yeah, that always helps. Okay, thanks a lot. And I see uh, two questions, one uh, still for you, Danny, and one for Sean uh, in the chat from Cathy. I don't know if Cathy, you want to ask your questions directly. Oh, well, all three presentations were excellent. Jenny, I was so excited by the process that you went on in trying to solve the challenge. And I thought that you're, particularly when you moved to grouping the partners around particular sections, I just thought that was really exciting. And I was wondering whether you had documented it or have plans to document in a, in a how-to guide or a process guide. And I just put in the chat that um, the city of Melbourne on a much smaller scale, but it was it's very innovative, particularly in Australia, where the city of Melbourne partnered with um, a range of, of, of private groups and other levels of government and universities to buy a wind farm um, to get around the, the brown coal that supplies our city. Um, but they've documented it with some with support from um, the Cl Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. Um, but anyway, there's a link in the chat. Long question, and then there's also a question for Sean there, similarly aligned to other students who are involved in that really exciting work of collecting data and getting capacity. Are they involved in writing up or documenting their research? Um, so it's all about sharing so we can scale up, I guess. I will, I won't probably be able to find an, an, a good document for that, but of course, I, to, to, to start out slow. The, um, the, the companies have to report, that's for sure, but um, what they are doing and why they are still worthy to be an eco partner. Um, I will see if we have uh, documents in English um, uh, in, in where we can actually show how, how we have been doing that. I believe since we were just celebrating um, the partnership, the existence of the partnership for, we had kind of a um, um, birthday, there's another word for that. Anyway, um, but um, I'll, I'll see what I can do. If I don't have it now, I will send it uh, to, to Sylvia and Eugenia for, for sharing purposes. Anniversary, thank you. Shall I answer my question, Anna? Yeah, yes. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a very good point. Um, so it depends at what level uh, the modules are. You know, if it's a, a third year module that's taught and it's a class project, that's typically not the kind of 
there's not really publishable sort of results uh, and certainly it's students that wouldn't really be publishing yet as undergraduates but when we start doing uh, master's modules uh, for this development studies that i talked about that's actually a master's module then it becomes uh, quite publishable you know we have we've only been going a couple of years so we haven't seen students sort of did uh, published just on their work, but as part of their broader degree scheme, then that, that becomes uh, possible. And certainly for us as the, the sort of the runners of this approach and the, the architects of the Durban Research Action Partnership, we, we publish on our transdisciplinary experiences. And so we've had two publications that haven't included EPIC up to now, but the one that we're working on our third publication in this sort of over this 10 year period that will certainly look at things like epic and so from the point of view of sharing our experience and uh, rolling out epic on africa and in an, a, a global south uh, partnership that we'll talk about uh, we've got a way to go before our students are really publishing their own work uh, as part of the epic projects thanks I see clapping hands uh, for for your uh, experience <laughs> that I, I definitely cheer uh, together with the colleagues, uh, your initiative. And I think um, if I may, just one question again to you, to you Shen, which was something that I was hinting at before. Um, how did you actually manage to convince uh, your colleagues and uh, the city administration that we know being quite resistant uh, to innovation and especially to have someone that comes into their system acting within uh, the structure? How do you manage to convince them to, to pilot this action? Yeah, you know, we're I'm a, we're a bit of a, a strange ca uh, case in Durban. Most EPIC partnerships are started by academia, uh, uh, academic colleagues approaching the city. But I'm actually in the city, but I'm also an honorary research associate with this university. So we're a bit of an oddball uh, <laughs> case. But because we had this existing research, uh, uh, transdisciplinary research partnership, the Durban Research Action Partnership, uh, we already had a... a, a a set of academics that was kind of captured for us and for me the the interesting thing was that they weren't very accept uh, you know they didn't they were they resisted the approach at first when i first said well listen i've got colleagues in america that have this great model that would be applied here in durban i've got no traction in the beginning uh, and it was people that i thought would be quite in, open to the idea and partly because you know they were busy, they, they, it's something new. It's a risk. I saw Sylvia, your your question, your answer to the that question was risk, and this is a good example. It's a risk trying something new, and so we didn't get anyone <laughs> to, to do this except for in one uh, the a community based river management program called the Palmy Catchment Rehabilitation Partnership that. Uh, academic there was already working closely with this community and she was open to the idea and so we did the pilot with her and because of that success it's now growing so all our DRAP the steering committee uh, academics are into the, into this approach now and we're getting traction so yeah I know it, it was difficult in the beginning and I was a bit discouraged at one stage but you know it's going and the fact that other African cities are taking it up is, is evidence that it suits our approach. Uh, Epica started in, Latin, in uh, Southeast Asia and they've gone really well. They've overtaken us in Africa. They were the second lot. And now in Latin America, it's being introduced as well. So it's a, a, an approach that's growing globally. And uh, maybe uh, in Europe, uh, you might sort of, you probably have something similar already around, but you know, it's, it's worth having this conversation. Absolutely. And I think that Jenny actually have a question here for you as well. Yeah, it's, it's actually a question to, to both Sean and, and Lan Franco um, in respect of um, citizen engagement, so to say, uh, whether it's with the universities or not, but maybe, um, did, and then to Sylvia as well. Um, did you notice resistance from the administration um, when engaging citizens. So I saw the picture of Lanfranco um, uh, of the building that, that the, where citizens were actually doing plastering works at the walls, for example. So I imagine my city's people for buildings saying, you have to do that right. So we cannot, so we cannot accept some amateurs 
um, doing something for the city. So we have to have rules and we have to, to do certain, uh, certain things that, that have um, an impact on the city. So did you notice from, from that administrative, administrative, administration part resistance and how, would you, how did you deal with that if you did? Maybe it's something that I would only assume would happen here. I, I mean, in, in our in our example, uh, my position as deputy mayor uh, <laughs> makes uh, someone in the administration uh, uh, more. Um, I, I mean, th th there is this kind of approach. Someone is saying, uh, "How can you manage to do this kind of thing with self construction and so on?" But Obviously, uh, all the rules in this kind of work have to be uh, have to be taken and, and to be applied. So there are also, there are always uh, engineers or architects that signs the project. Uh, maybe private citizens that uh, are operating as volunteers, and uh, there's a kind of resistance in the public work uh, structure, but uh, in this case, uh, the politics is uh, uh, the politics want to reach this goal, so <laughs> maybe they have to follow the the indication. But uh, uh, I know that uh, there is a strong resistance in involving citizens in the self construction uh, uh, project. But uh, they they found a deputy mayor. Which is uh, me. I am uh, really convinced of this kind of project, so they have to follow my indication in this case. But uh, the, for for me, uh, for my point of from my point of view, the, the rules are respected because uh, all the works are done in uh, with uh, all the the necessary signs from the uh, professionist. So uh, I think uh, the, the 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 final the the, the the final work is, is the same as a public uh, procurement, uh, traditional uh, procurement. So mm, I would say in some case, uh, volunteers do it better because <laughs> maybe they, they are working on a, a project they are involved in. So they are working on a, on a place that they are going to live for some years, so they are really interested in doing uh, the work well, and <laughs> so I I usually usually have uh, problems in convincing before the start of the project. But at the, the end, uh, uh, everyone has to recognize that the volunteers work uh, work it good. Uh, talking about uh, the park, the the green, uh, so the trees, and uh, so this this kind of green works, but also the Infra little infrastructure works. I, I obviously wouldn't make a, a street or some, but a, like a building, a single building, a, some two or three rooms that have to be restored by volunteers. I think we, we managed well this kind of goal. And I think we are following the, 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 the Italian laws about infrastructure and public buildings. So I am quite. Uh, I think we are quite safe. Uh, or uh, uh, I, I think we 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 are following the rules in a different way, but the, the rules are followed. I think also this is kind the 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 CSO project. So the the um, the need of an office that is about the urban innovation also. Uh, involve the regulatory uh, aspects. So this kind of aspect, you, you can talk about urban innovation uh, uh, without challenging uh, the, the, the innovation of regulatory aspects. It's totally agree. I was not implying, by the way, that you are not following the rules, just, just to make that clear. I'm just talking, I'm just thinking about some of the old um, fashioned people in the administration. That's, that's all. Thank yeah, you. We, we are full of uh, <laughs> this kind of people, but uh, now they have to be convinced in doing this kind of project.
from the outside, uh, Olympranka, you actually hit the nail on the head. Following the rules, but in a different way, is such a perfect phrase because that's exactly what we do. You know, if we if we get external funding from a, a global funding body or even internal funding, and we have to go through procurement and all those processes, we are so inefficient in the city that it can be the death of the project. So we don't like to take money. <laughs> if we're asking for, for money from anywhere, we say, don't give it to us. We don't want it. Uh, and uh, quite often uh, in our example now with our EPIC program, we managed to secure national funding through the, the Durban Research Action Partnership. So the city didn't see any money. And so we were able to do, use these innovative approaches with much less risk than if we had to do it with city funding, because then there's all sorts of reporting. And if you get a red face on your reporting, then you're in trouble. It's not good. So you always go for the green face or rather just don't go for the money in the first place. And we've, we had that's something that's repeated time and time again. I mean, we've got some great innovative projects in the city looking at communities managing our waterways. And we try and avoid not taking money for it, um, but we, we fund it in our innovative financing mechanisms. In terms of getting our city folk to play with us, uh, my boss, my previous boss, Deborah Roberts, who you probably know is RPCC co-chair, she was very shrewd. Back in the, the, the noughties, uh, she uh, built up a cohort of champions from engineers to planners, and, and she got them switched on to climate change and particularly uh, nature-based solutions. So Durban's been doing nature-based solutions since the early 2000s. And this group of champions has stayed intact. And we're the ones that are sort of driving a lot of this work. I joined in 2011. Um, but, you know, it's so encouraging to know that you have colleagues in, the, in your organization who think along the same way, you know, sustainability, nature-based solutions, um, you know, putting communities at the, the, the beginning of your actions, addressing past historical injustices and all that. But it gives you a core of people to work with that you can approach with this, this innovation and they open to innovation. And you see a lot of the, the peer reviewed uh, papers that have come out of uh, Durban, a lot of it is built around partnerships and innovation. And that's how Durban does the work that it does. Not following the rules, but in a good way, <laughs> in a way that the, the most, you know, that if you had to follow them farther, oh, you have to find alternative ways of doing this stuff that are still le legal. <laughs> Yeah, I think we can, everyone's agree on the fact that we are not pushing for illegal ways, <laughs> but indeed to interpret and find uh, alternatives, as Sean was rightly mentioned. So thank you so much. Uh, Eugenia, should we maybe open up the mirror? Yes, sure. So we are now moving actually to the interactive part of our workshop. The good thing about this virtual whiteboard we want to use is that actually we can leave it open uh, for one week, so in case, and I think we won't have time today to to probably address all the questions because this discussion was so interesting that actually it, uh, it was uh, super worth uh, continuing it. Uh, but we will keep this virtual whiteboard open for you to just go uh, and and make your uh, your comments uh, during the week. So until uh, next week, let's say next Thursday. Uh, so we have prepared this exercise because we wanted to. Uh, discuss together with you uh, and to understand how you and your cities are working with innovation at the local level, focusing on four different questions. Uh, so these questions will be partnerships for innovation. And while I am uh, writing this, I'm actually looking for the link, but maybe today you have it more handy than me. Thanks. <laughs> so the first question would be partnerships for innovation, uh, to understand a bit which kind of partnerships do you already have in your cities, or that you are looking forward to, uh, to develop, you are thinking to uh, to develop, uh, to carry out your innovative projects, and how these partnerships are really helping you or will help you to reach your, uh, your climate targets. Uh, then another block that you'll see in this uh, whiteboard is uh, about your needs. What would you need to unlock the potential of innovation? And it could be, for example, uh, and we heard a lot about it already, but uh, to have political buy-in, to have active SMEs, active companies, uh, that want to get engaged, more funding or innovative financing, uh, which type of, uh, uh, of uh, fund financing mechanisms uh, or different regulation, for example. Another block is about, ah, oh, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, and the link, yes, is in the chat. Another question is about uh, the main challenges and the bottlenecks you're experiencing. 
So is it, for example, um, the big challenge to build long lasting partnerships? So maybe you have a lot of interest at the beginning, but then this fades out with time to securing funding without the guarantee on the results, which is also in the nature of experimentation. And it's one of the risks, of course, to get the political level on board. Uh, and finally, we would also like to pick your brains uh, on uh, one very important question when it comes to piloting and experimenting. And we heard about successful examples, but, but I'm sure that will be also unsuccessful examples or things that you have been trying and uh, they didn't work, it happens. That's uh, in the nature of things. How to make pilot projects and experimentation sustainable over time and how to make sure actually what's driven by, for example, um, a project, a cooperation with university, a strong political will can be continued in the medium and long term when these initial conditions uh, end, for example. Uh, so one of the examples that we hear from a lot of cities in Europe is uh, linked to, for example, European funding for research and innovation. What happens after the, uh, the project or the pilot has ended? How to make sure that uh, the experimentation can be enshrined into the, the functioning of the, of the city? So we would like to give you now uh, 10 minutes or less, let's say seven minutes to just think about these questions. You can add some post-its. Silviana will also add some of the replies that were already given by our speakers. Uh, and then of course, we will just look back at this and go back to it uh, for our conclusion, but it's remain open and we will then share it with you in one week so that you can all see uh, what, was, uh, what was said. And while you start uh, there, I also wanted to flag up actually a very nice opportunity because we spoke a lot today uh, about the, um, the need actually to bring the examples out and to have other cities get inspired and learn from each other. In the Covenant of Mayors, we have a peer learning program. I'm passing now the link in the chat uh, that's open until 25th of March for applications. We are matching cities uh, with, with peers. It's only open to European cities, so I'm very sorry, Sean. Um, but it's, uh, it's really open to cities of all sizes and it's the uh, step or level of implementation of their climate action plans. Uh, and I really invite you to, to join this, uh, this program because it's, uh, it's very interesting. You will be connected with a city that has similar needs and challenges and you will have study visits uh, and a very in-depth uh, cooperation uh, with the city spot. Have a look at the link and see you in five minutes.
Okay, I see a lot of activities still going on. Uh, I think we can just come back before wrapping up to see some of the ideas and comments that you've been sharing. Um, and then, of course, as I said, the, uh, the Miro board will, be, will, will uh, stay open, sorry, for one week. So you're, of course, very welcome to go there anytime you want and add new ideas. Uh, so starting with the partnerships for innovation, we have two comments. One is about having community-based um, no, that's about uh, uh, an example about community-based river management projects that allow for governance, job creation, valorization, and cooperation. Uh, upscaling the existing program to cover the whole city. I don't know who made this comment, but uh, if you can also write it in the chat, it would be interesting also for others to know where is this, um, this project uh, taking place. Uh, and then we have a uh, post about citizenship, citizenship packs, public private community agreements. That's something uh, very interesting. And actually, many cities are, uh, are trying to experiment this more and more, especially with the establishment of these local climate packs. And actually, uh, I think it's, uh, it's becoming clearer that that's going to be essential to become climate neutral because climate neutrality is not a job just for the city administration, of course. Uh, then moving on um, about the key challenges, uh, here there was a lot of inspiration. Uh, so municipal rules, for example, like the method of monitoring the implementation of projects and effective system does not allow for failure. Uh, that's a challenge. Uh, thank you, Sean, for this comment. It's, uh, it's true that's, uh, that's really probably one of the most shared challenges uh, among uh, covenant signatories and cities in general. Cultural resistance, innovative projects compared to what is known as familiar, the need to build trust, uh, rules and regulation again. So innovative ideas uh, are not enough and you need stamina. Very, very uh, good point if you like to engage. A facilitator, moderator, but also I think, yeah, you need the, uh, to sustain the effort on the long, on the long, on the long time to uh, really go through with the projects. Sharing goods and, goods and knowledge, empowering communities, co-management and co-ownership. Uh, and yes, another point on the fact that it's very complicated to maintain partnerships. So sometimes it's easier to establish them than to maintain them. Uh, and lack of standardization when it comes to reporting and measuring the, uh, the success of projects. Uh, also true. Silvia, if you can move to one other block, the one you prefer. Okay, so we move to unlocking the potential of innovation. Uh, so simpler regulation of the public-private agreements and of self-construction projects. So simplifying actually the, the bottlenecks at the regulatory level and the political buy-in. Uh, that's important, but also having peers open to innovation um, is where this is at. And again, a good example from Durban where uh, luckily you have like minded city officials. About that, I wanted also to flag up to you one event that is taking place in Helsingborg uh, at the beginning of June that's called Urban Future Global Conference. The Covenant Office is a partner of this event. I will send you the link into the, uh, the follow-up message, uh, but there is a whole strand of sessions about changing structures within the city. Uh, so that might be interesting actually to, to also hear about other examples on, uh, on how these challenges are, are addressed in other cities. And then finally, how to make pilot projects and experimentation sustainable over time. Here we have having shared goals. Uh, I think this also relates to having shared goals between the, uh, the different stakeholders, but also probably having a lot of strategy within the city administration. Uh, that is the orientation for your partnership, having co-ownership of the actions, shared management, uh, identify risks to sustainability very early in the project. Um, and Yes, also sharing the economic values. So little posting services, managing public buildings and so on. Uh, so thanks a lot for these preliminary inputs. I'm sure that there are a thousand other ideas that came to your mind, but you didn't have time probably to write down. So again, don't hesitate to go back to this Miro uh, whenever you want in the next week. Um, and we also, I also read that you're asking if the slides recording and outcome of the webinar will be shared afterwards, of course. So the recording will be shared on the Covenant website. The uh, presentations will be shared with you all as participants, and we will also publish an article on the, uh, on the Covenant website. Um, so I, I really want to thank you all. And I would like to, before closing, actually, uh, if you have to still like two remaining minutes of your time, to just give the floor to Cathy uh, for some, uh, if you have some final remarks or some comments actually on these challenges and how they can then feed back into the 
the work that you're doing to understand challenges, bottlenecks, and how we can enable cities to develop more innovative uh, actions. Oh, goodness. Um, uh, two minutes. This has really been fascinating. And as you say, this has really, you know, been a great opportunity for um, the GCOM and the Research and Innovation Technical Working Group to, you know, have a deeper dive into what does this all mean from a European perspective and, and hopefully we can roll this out in other areas around the world. And I really like, especially in the chat, Charlotte, Charlotte has mentioned around innovation and, and governance. And I think that that was a really great point to include that, and I think it's come through the mirror boards, that innovation is not just about tech, it's not just about large amounts of money, it's really innovation around the whole chain um, of a city um, journey around climate action. And so, um, yeah, focusing on all steps along this on the phase. And, um, and to Sean and to Lanfranco and to Jenny's presentation, you know, really, I heard it's about taking risk and, and enabling an environment where cities are, are feel safe to take risks. And I think that we've had some really great innovation tonight. Well, tonight my time is getting quite late. Uh, in uh, your, your day, it's, um, you know, innovation is inspiring and, and hopefully that is what enables that acceleration to, to happen at pace. Thank you very much uh, to you, Cathy, to Paris, to Sylvia, who has been moderating the session to our speakers and the amazing examples that we look forward to really like spread the word about uh, as much as we can and to all the participants for staying with us also one minute later than we, than we were supposed to. So thanks a lot. And we're always available if there are questions that come even after the workshop. Thank you.